I guess the title for the sermon is The Ways of a Backslider. The Ways of a Backslider. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Ties were invented to clean glasses with. What's that? You got no other use. Second Chronicles chapter 14. You know, it's uh, it's exciting to see when a, a new Christian comes to faith and he's on fire and he's got a zeal for God and he, you know, sometimes it's a zeal but not according to knowledge, you know, and and it's, but it's exciting to see that. And you know, when a, a when a Christian's been truly converted and they're really on fire for God. Then maybe sometimes after a few years that that fire begins to be quenched a little bit. And they, you know, they start to mature a little bit and we're not so excited. And sometimes they get so unexcited they, they backslide. Well, King Asa was a man in the Old Testament that really uh, was a good example of when a believer, you know, who loves God, who is a man of, of faith, but when he backslides and falls into a bit of a, a period of declension and backsliding. And so, but the good news is that God says, I can heal your backsliding. And there's hope for the backslider. But I want to look at, at King Asa, first of all, here, as an example of a backslider. In Second Second Chronicles chapter 14, starting in verse 1, So Abijah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his stead, in his days, the land was quiet ten years. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. Also, he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images and the kingdom, of, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. And he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. By the way, you know, when a man's ways please the Lord, the Lord maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Amen. Therefore he said unto Judah, Let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us. He said, Because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought him. And he hath given us rest on every side, so they have built and prosper. Asa was a man who loved the Lord. He, he sought after God. He had a heart for God. He wanted to obey God. So then Asa had an army of men that bare targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000. Out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. There came out against them Zerah, the Ethiopian, with a host of a thousand thousand. That's a million for your mathematicians. And three hundred chariots and came unto Mereshah. And then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathah and Mereshah. Now Asa was outnumbered at least two to one here. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name. We go out against this multitude. O oh Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. See, Asa was a believer in the Lord. He was a man of faith. He was a true believer. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. You know, when you, when you go to war, when you go to battle, you're trusting in the Lord against a, a company that outnumbers you two to one. You're a believer. You know, he was, he was a man of faith. So they, they won this battle, and they had a great revival that, that came in Israel. And here in the first part of chapter 15, a, a prophet came and prophesied to Asa. said, as long as you seek the Lord your God, God's going to bless you. And it was a, a word of encouragement from the prophet. And then down in verse 10 of chapter 15, So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And, the same time, and they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, 7, 000, excuse me, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. They had a great national revival. Asa brought about a great national revival. Whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. 
And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting, with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and saw him with their whole desire. Don't you love that? We're talking national revival here. I wish we could see that in America today. And he was found of them. The Lord gave them rest round about. Also concerning Maok, the mother of Asa the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in the grove. Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burned it at the brook Kedron. The high places were not taken out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. But you know, as with many men of God, time passes, a little pride sets in. You know, 20 years later, perhaps Asa has become a little bit complacent in his faith. You know, he maybe become a little bit prideful in his prosperity. He begins to trust actually more in money than he does in God. And he backslides. And so we see in chapter 16, in the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa, that's 20 years later, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So he besieged them. Wouldn't let any food get into them. Wouldn't let them ship anything out. So then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So he bribed his enemy's ally to turn against his enemy. Rather than trusting in the Lord, he trusted in his riches. And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Ijan and Dan, and etc., etc. You know, just because the plan worked doesn't mean that they were in God's will. Verse 6, Then Asa the king took all Judah and carried away the stones of Ramah, the timber thereof, where with Baasha was building, and he built there with Geba and Mizpah. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hands. He paid off Syria, Ben-Hadad, to turn against Israel, and now he's going to have Syria as an enemy. He says, We're not the Ethiopians and the Lubians, the large host. Remember that, that army of a million back here in chapter 14? With very many horse, chariots and horsemen, yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now we see a little bit of Asa's pride. He says, Asa was wroth with the seer. And put him in a prison house where he was in a rage with him because of this thing. He's no longer listening to the prophets of God. See, this man's backslidden. Where he once sought the Lord with all of his heart. He won't even listen to the prophets of God now. He's backslidden. It's a sad story. It's a somewhat sad ending to what began and could have ended as a great success story. But now Asa's legacy is that he became a backslider. That's his legacy. Started out on fire for God, brought great revival to Judah and Israel. But he lost his zeal for God. He lost the fire. And he ended up trusting more in his money. And later we see he trusted in his positions rather than the Lord. See in verse 11, Behold the acts of Asa, the first and last, though they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. So he lost faith in God. Why is that? He, he became backslidden. You know, sometimes a Christian will start out on fire for God, but they later lose their zeal as well. I've seen that happen to Christians. Maybe we're seeing that happen to some people we know right now. Second Corinthians 5.17, we quote it often in this church. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things pass away, all things become new. And when that happens... You have a zeal for God, and it's a wonderful thing to see. That happened with me. When I first got saved, I was a completely different person. I saw the whole world in a new light. I heard a sermon about backsliding and how Christians can backslide and lose their zeal. And I remember praying early on, Lord, don't let me ever 
Stop being a fanatic. And I think that while true salvation can never be lost, the initial fire and the initial zeal for, for God can be lost. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit of God. If Christians are not careful, they can quench the Spirit in their lives. You know, we are commanded to grow up, move on to maturity, but that doesn't mean that you're supposed to lose the zeal and the fire for God. And we ought not lose that zeal and that fire. We can quench the Spirit in, in many various ways, primarily through disobedience, through failing to listen, as I was preaching earlier about how you begin to reject the light that God sends darkness. That happens to a Christian, by the way. That happens to Christians. Some Christians get, they start out on the right track, they get, some, sometimes they get turned aside by false doctrine that quenches their zeal. Some legalism, perhaps. Bondage bandwagons, like the Galatians fell into. Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. You did run well. I know a preacher used to be a anti-501c3, unincorporated preacher. But he just, I don't know what happened. He used to, he, he did run well. I don't know what hindered him, but he's not running anymore. He quit running. Some Christians get disillusioned at the price that has to be paid living the Christian life. Separation from the world that God demands. Possible persecution. Some Christians get a little bit complacent in the Christian life. Maybe a little bit bored. Maybe fall prey to the allurements of this world. Demas was one of those men. Paul's traveling companion on his missionary journeys. At one time, Demas risked his life. For Paul's sake and for the gospel. But then he later got turned aside. To the point where in 2 Timothy, Paul has to write these sad words. This is his farewell sign-off address to Timothy. The last of his letters. When he knew he he was about to die. He said, I've fought a good fight. 2 Timothy 4 verse 7. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Isn't that sad? Demas hath forsaken me. Sometimes a new believer comes to Christ having been gloriously delivered from the life of sin. Having been addict, you know, addicted to various sins, but being delivered out of those addictions and wicked behavior. Then sometimes later, perhaps due to some calamity in his life, some perhaps devastating turn of events, or just simply a dropping of his spiritual guard. Much to his shame and misery and despair, he gives into a temptation. And he falls back into those old ways again. He gets entangled and snared in some of those old addictions. That's possible for a Christian to do. The Bible describes this as a condition called backsliding. It's something the Bible warns us against. It's something God forbids us to do. But it's also something that God can, by His grace and His mercy, deliver us out of again. (coughs) So I want to talk tonight about the characteristics of a backslider. What are some warning signs of backsliding? Number one, you know you're backslidden. You know you're backslidden if you walk by sight rather than by faith. If you begin to walk by sight rather than by faith, you know you're backslidden. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. But the backslider does just the opposite. He walks by sight rather than by faith, which results from walking in the flesh rather than the spirit. See, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, but where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. But a backslider sets his affections on things of the earth. He can't, he, he doesn't have the eyes of faith to see what's above. He focuses on just the physical realm right here that you can see with his physical eyes. He doesn't have eyes of faith. 
His focus and affection is on the material world, not in the kingdom. His eye is on the earthly reward rather than the heavenly. A good definition of walking by faith, I believe, is an unswerving trust in the revealed word of God, even when circumstances seem to say otherwise. The backslider walks by sight rather than by faith. He lives by his perception of circumstance rather than by what God's Word says. He looks strictly at the here and now, not at the future. He succumbs to circumstance. He loses faith in God to change his circumstance. He looks at the way things are rather than with the eyes of faith as to the way things can be when God changes them. He loses faith in God to change things. We have to remember that God wants to change things for us, but we have to, He wants us to pray first. He knows what we need before we ask, but He wants us to ask. But a backslider doesn't have the faith to do that. Number two, you know you're backslidden if you make decisions without praying. If you make decisions without praying. A backslider due to his pride feels capable of making decisions without God's guidance, like King Asa did. I don't think, I don't, I didn't read anywhere in that story back there where King Asa prayed before he decided to pay off Ben Hadad of Syria. I didn't read where Asa prayed about that. I didn't read where Joshua prayed before he made a, a contract with the, the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9. Without praying, Joshua made a bad a bad contract with them. If you make important decisions without praying, it may be due to the fact that you're backslidden. Uh, number three, you know you're backslidden if your relationship with Christ is not what it once was. Your relationship with Christ is not what it once was. Your prayer life has become minimized or non-existent. If you think you don't have time to pray, you're backslidden. If you've come to a point in your life where you think prayer is pointless, you are backslidden. And you need to repent. Prayer changes things. God answers prayer. The remedy in this circumstance is, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to pray without ceasing. That means don't give up. Don't give up. Don't stop trusting in God to answer prayer. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying for your family. Don't stop praying for your wife, for your husband, for your children. Don't stop praying for God's guidance. God can change things. Don't make important decisions without praying. Take time to pray just to focus on the Lord. Just to spend time in His presence and thanksgiving and praise. Lord Jesus said, the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He commends them for all their service and for their strong doctrine. They've tried those who say they're apostles or not and has found them liars. They're standing strong in the faith and they're doing all kinds of service. But he said, but you've left your first love. You forgot about me, Jesus said. We can't forget about him. You know you're backslidden if your relationship with Christ is not what it once was. Jesus said to them, remember, therefore... And once thou art fallen, then repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick. I'll turn the lights out. I'll remove your candlestick. Reject the light, he sends darkness. Amen. Number four, you know you're backslidden if you are comfortable around worldly and wicked people. Many examples in the Bible of people that got into bad company and turned from God. Solomon, Asa. One of the best examples is Lot, back in the Old Testament. It says in Genesis chapter 13, you might want to turn there. Genesis chapter 13, verse 5. So then Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. The lamb was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and Perizzite dwelt in the land at that time. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, 
between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If thou depart the right hand, I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. See, Lot was walking. He, he was walking by sight, not by faith. He lifted up his eyes. Beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest to Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. By the way, it doesn't say that some of the men were wicked exceedingly. It doesn't even say that most of the men were wicked exceedingly. They were all wicked. All the people of Sodom were wicked, not just a majority. But you know what? Lot became comfortable with these people. First he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then he moved his family into the city. And then he sought a leadership position in that city. He wanted to be popular. How do we know that? He actually ran for city council. Because in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, when the, when the angels came to destroy Sodom, Genesis 19, verse 1, there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground. What's it mean to be sitting in the gate? In the Old Testament times, the gates of the cities where the town council would meet, where the elders would meet together to, to decide issues. Lot sat in the gate. It was, a, it was a place of leadership in the city. He had become popular and well-known with the wicked men of the land. He was comfortable there. You know what? A Christian who is comfortable around wicked people is backslidden. He's walking in the flesh. We have been called as Christians to separation from this world. And especially from unbelievers. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we know the passage. Second Corinthians 6.14 Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. He's talking to the church. The church is the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It's conditional for us to enjoy this position of sonship and enjoying the Father to be treated like a son. We have to come out and be separate. Lot's mistake was that he thought he could sit in the gate and make and make these Sodomites better people. He thought he could maybe maybe my righteousness will rub off on them. Maybe I can change them. I know he's I know he's not saved now, but I'll change him later. A righteous person will never sanctify or purify the ungodly. Jay taught about this last week or week before. The ungodly will always corrupt and defile the righteous. Never the other way around. Some foolish Christians think they can be friends with and hang out with ungodly people. Perhaps make them more godly in the process. It's not going to happen. I like the illustration that Jade gave. It's a lot easier to pull somebody off a chair than it is to pull them back up onto a chair. Whatever is defiled, coming in contact with the clean, always defiles the clean. A righteous person will never sanctify or purify the ungodly. Christians are also called to separation from the world and from worldly ways. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The Bible says that, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Christians have been called out to separation from this world. 
Bible says, Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's, those are serious words. If we think we can be a Christian and be a friend of this world, you're deceived. You're backslidden. If you think that. We're called to be separate. We're also called, by the way, to separate ourselves from sinning brethren in hopes that they will repent and get back in God's will. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after tradition which he received of us. Verse 14, he says that if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. He's talking about men in the church. If any man among you in your assembly obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. Have no company with him that he may be ashamed. We're to separate ourselves from sinning brethren in hopes that they'll repent. We're called to separation. Lot's family became desensitized to the heinousness of the sin in their culture. Just as we have in America today. Desensitized. Here, yesterday, the Senate passes this bill. So now it's okay to, for the military, you know, to be a bunch of sodomites. Repeal the don't ask, don't tell. I wish it had, I wish they had repealed don't ask, don't tell and say, and said, we're gonna ask you now. If you're queer, you can't come in the army. That's what they should have done. We're, we're gonna repeal this. If you're queer, we don't want you. They should have done. That's what they should have done. Because they knew how it would demoralize the army. There's no more demoralizing thing that they could do. It's bad enough they put women in the army. I mean, only, only a wicked, stupid leadership would put women and homosexuals in the army. Stupidity. But you know how many Christians will. That's... Hey, that's what the government says. We gotta obey the government. We gotta obey the government, don't we? Desensitize the heinousness. We've got a, a nation of Christians that have backslidden, have we not? We've got a, a nation that has backslidden. A Christian who resigns himself to accept the wicked culture around him, and who, don't, who no longer blushes at the evil we are bombarded with on a daily basis, is a backslidden Christian, walking in the flesh, not the spirit. Number five, you're backslidden if you have compromised former moral standards. A Christian that falls into sins that once frightened him, that he's now desensitized to is backslidden. He's a backslider. Whatever it may be. Foul language, drugs, alcohol, pornography, whatever it may be. Whatever you've fallen into that you were once frightened of, now you're desensitized to. What happened? Your conscience got seared somehow. You partake of it just a little bit, and your, your conscience begins to get there. Well, it's not so bad. Before too long, you're hooked. You have a seared conscience. You don't think it's, you don't blush anymore. Because you're backslidden. First Timothy 4, verse 1 to 2 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron. Seared conscience. Typical path of teenage rebellion. Starts with, with one thing and moves to it to the next. Starts many times with bad music that glorifies the devil in the world. Then goes to smoking cigarettes and then smoking marijuana, burning your brains out. That's the path of rebellion. Backsliders need to come back out of the world and come back to Jesus. Number six, you know you're backslidden if you are slow to obey God's Word. Slow to obey. Back to Lot. Lot's example in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. Lot was slow to obey. Verse 12, The men said unto Lot, Hast thou any here besides, son-in-law, thy sons and thy daughters? Whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. Now, this is, these are the, this is the angels talking. It's a lot. Giving them a, giving Lot a word from the Lord, this is what you have to do. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. Lot went out, 
spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, see, Lot lingered. He was a little bit slow to obey. While he lingered, he didn't, he didn't want to obey. Perhaps he didn't want to look for whatever reason. He didn't want to leave his sons-in-law, or, or we, we don't know. But he lingered. He was slow to obey. So the men, the angels, laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. They forced him out. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. They said, we can't do anything until, you, until we get you out of here. God expects our obedience to be immediate, by the way. He expects immediate obedience, not delayed. Parents, by the way, should expect the same of their children. Number seven, you know you're really backslidden. If you can reject God's word altogether, you know you are really backslidden. First, you know you're backslidden if you're slow to obey, but if you can reject God's word altogether, not only are you backslidden, but you may not be saved. If you can say that you don't care what God's word says about some issue, then you're either severely backslidden or you're not saved. You may not be saved at all. I do believe, though, that sometimes Christians... True people of God can make conscious decisions to disobey God, go their own way instead. Christians do that. They can do that. If you can do that, you're backslidden. Good example of that is Jonah. Jonah, by the way, was a real person. He was a real prophet of God. We read about Jonah in the historical book of Second Kings, chapter 14, verse 25 where we see that uh, King Jeroboam, son of Joash, restored, it says he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath to the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath So Jonah was a real man, a real prophet. The story of Jonah is a true story that I believe we should take literally. And it says in Jonah, in Jonah's own prophecy, Chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah said, No, I'm not going to do that. Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fee, that the fare thereof, went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He said, no, I'm not going to do what God says. That's, that's a backslidden prophet there. I mean, you know, he was a prophet of God. God spake through this man. He had to be have, living in some certain level of holiness for God to choose him as a prophet. For him, to, for him to be called. But the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet. But here he said, no, I'm not going to do that. He was backslidden, was he not? If you know what God's Word says, and you know what God wants you to do, if you know God wants you to quit some sin, and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, you're backslidden. If you know God wants you to treat your wife better, and you say, I'm not going to do that. If you know God wants you to reach out to the lost, but you won't, you're backslidden. That's you, then you may be a backslidden Jonah who might end up in the belly of the big fish. Someplace you don't want to be. It is a believer who is rejecting God's word is standing on very thin ice. And as I said, it may be a sign of a make believer. Jesus said to those that rejected his word in John chapter 8, He said, He that is of God heareth. God's words. John 8, 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. One sign of being truly saved is that you will receive what God says. He says, He therefore hear them not because you are not of God. You are not born again. The reason you can't hear what God says is because you are not a true child of God. That's what he's saying. 
Some backsliders have fallen into sins and addictions that they know they need to repent of, but they think they can't quit. I have a message tonight that there is hope for the backslider. There is hope for the backslider. The Lord can heal your backsliding. The Lord can heal the backslider. That's why I put the key verse for this week in your bulletin is Jeremiah chapter 3. 12 through 14 and then verse, verse 22. But before I read that, I want to read, starting in verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 3. Where God says, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Backsliding Israel, who once sought me, who I gave the law to, I led through the Red Sea. I appeared to them in the cloud, the pillar of fire by night. I lit up Mount Sinai in front of them, and I spoke to them from heaven. Have you seen what this backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up upon every high mountain under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Played the harlot. Spiritual harlotry. Turn to another religion. Idolatry. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. That's God's heart. Say, turn thou unto me. But she returned not. Her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, for when all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I'd put her away, given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And in verse 11, the Lord says, The Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. But then he says this to Jeremiah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. And say, Return, thou backsliding Israel. Saith the Lord, I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Acknowledge thine iniquity. For thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to strangers under every green tree, under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Now here's God's heart. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. Look down to verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. I will heal your backslidings. There is hope for the backslider who thinks he's in bondage. He's fallen back into sin. He may have actually become entrapped in some old addiction he thinks he can't get out of. God says, I will heal your backsliding. There is hope for a backslider. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. God says the same thing to the prophet Hosea. Same thing to the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 11. Hosea 11, chapter 11, verse 7. God says, and my people are bent to backsliding from me. My people just have this tendency, this bent, they just, they backslide. You know, they, they were on fire and they have a zeal for a while, but then they, they get complacent and they get bored and they backslide. But then he says in chapter 14, verse 4, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. When anger is turned away from him, there is hope for the backslider. You don't have to remain in bondage. God can heal you and deliver you again, just as he did when he saved you. You need, number one, to repent of your sin and come back to Jesus. You must repent. You must acknowledge that your sin is sin. You have to separate yourself from worldly people in worldly ways. Don't give yourself over to sin. You have to do what God told Israel to do. Return, thou backsliding Israel. You have to return. You have to repent. Don't give yourself over to sin. Pray unceasingly for deliverance. For any propensity or addiction to sin. Ask others to pray for you. Repent of your sin and come back to Jesus. Number two, saturate yourself in the Scriptures. Saturate yourself in Scripture. There's a saying that says, either sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. That's the way it works. If you're addicted and if you're lost in some sin, you, you feel too dirty to come to this book. But you need to get in it anyway. Sin will keep you from this book. 
But you need to let this book keep you from sin because this book has a cleansing, supernatural cleansing effect. The most powerful thing on earth to come out of sin is the Bible. Saturate yourself with Scripture. You have to feed your spirit, man. Take time every day to meditate on God's Word. And if you're, if you really feel lost in some sin, then get in the Bible and don't, don't come out. Just stay there. Immerse yourself in the Bible. Let the Holy Spirit lead you to what He wants to show you. The Bible has a supernatural cleansing effect. Jesus said in John chapter 15 verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How, Wherewithal shall young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible has a cleansing effect. Saturate yourself in the, in the Scriptures. Number three, restore your prayer life. You have to take time to pray. You have to believe that God can answer your prayers. You have to, number four, walk by faith, not by sight. You must walk by faith. In other words, you have to believe what God says, even when it doesn't appear that your prayers are going to be answered. You have to believe what God says without questioning it. Don't ever think prayer is pointless. Don't succumb to circumstance. Have faith in God to perform His Word. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. We have to remember that God wants to change things for us, but He wants us to pray first. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, Just as surely as God can judge the wicked, God can deliver the righteous. Now, I've got news for you. God is surely going to judge the wicked. He's going to judge the devil and his angels. Second Peter chapter 2. Peter says, God can deliver you. He says, verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment. He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. See, see, if God had done all these things, and He delivered just Lot, verse 7, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. See, if God can do all those things, then verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Just as surely as God can judge the wicked, God can, de can deliver the backslider. Amen? We have to walk by, by faith, not by sight. Don't give in to your sin. Believe God can deliver you from it. Restore your prayer life. Take time every day to spend with Jesus in prayer with the Father. Saturate yourself in the Scripture. Repent of your sin and come back to Jesus. Paul says, in closing, in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 22, Paul is lamenting this spiritual battle that we fight as Christians. He's talking as a saved, born-again believer who battles, he's saying that, that this, my spirit battles my flesh. He says, the things that I don't want, I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. The things I know I should do, I, I can't do. Wretched man that I am. He says, verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because He can deliver me. He can deliver me. He can deliver the backslider. He can deliver us out of bondage. He came to set the captives free. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, I just, I pray for everyone here. I pray for myself, Lord, that you would protect us. That you would keep us in the palm of your hand, Lord, but that you would not let us backslide. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, help us not to lose the fire, not to lose our zeal. Not to stop being fanatics, Lord. I just, I pray for everyone here that you'd help us. If there's anyone here, Lord, that has backslidden, that has some sin in their life that they think they can't get out of, that you would, 
Help them tonight to see where they've been wrong, to repent and to acknowledge that, that you can deliver them. That they don't need to surrender themselves to any sin. That you can deliver them out of it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.